Um, let, let's touch uh, on your awards. We understand that, of course, you won the Distinguished Young Woman Scientist Award for 2014. What was the award all about? And, I mean, what does it mean to you? Um, well, it's quite an honor for me to win the award. It is the move from the Ministry of Science and Technology to acknowledge women researchers in South Africa and acknowledge the role that they play in knowledge production and also in research work that aims to look at um, the issues that we face as South Africa and the challenges and some of the ways that we can deal with the challenges in the country. Um, what do these accolades mean to you? I mean, just before you answer that, but I just want to make the audience aware that you also won the 2012-2013 UNISA Principals Award for Excellence in Research. What do these accolades mean to you as an academic? Well, they mean that the work that I do is important. The work that I do matters. And these, these awards are not only for research, but for teaching as well. So I think it's an acknowledgement of the important work that I do and the significance of the research work that I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> now, coming back to your PhD, um, you enrolled with the City University of New York. Um, how did you end up there? Um, I actually won a scholarship. I went there through the Fulbright Scholarship, which is awarded by the American government through the American Embassy here in South Africa. And did you end up by design or default? I mean, landing in the research fraternity? Um, it, was, it was by default. I actually ended up in the academia while I was still an undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. While in my second year, I was um, approached by one of my professors to be a tutor in um, one of the, the courses that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that was really the beginning for me of being an academic. And I never looked back since then. You never looked back. I never and, looked and, back. And since this is still Women's Month, yes, we're still going to ride on the August Women's <laughs> Month until the 31st of August. <laughs> but... Um, how does it, what does it mean to you as a woman being in the academic and research field? Because you often hear other women saying, you know, being a woman in mining is, is often challenging because mm. it's male dominated. Mm. Being women in, in certain industries is challenging. But for you as a woman in academia and research, is it challenging at all? Um, it is challenging, but it's a challenge that I face head on. The academia is still very populated by men, especially at professorial level, at um, higher positions, senior positions within the academia. And when we think about our young women, our girl children, who are also students at the university, it's important for them to also see women lecturers, women professors whom they can look up to and look at the possibilities and what is possible for them as young women. So I see my role as being in the academia not only as a knowledge producer but also as someone who is there to enable younger women to have a mirror that they can reflect on to see possibilities. Knowledge producer, I love that phrase. Yes. I definitely love that phrase. But let's get into some of your research now. One of them is you interrogated um, truth and reconciliation transcripts narrated by women survivors of the apartheid era. Just kindly tell us more about that. Um, actually, that started with me being interested in how women make sense of their everyday lived experiences. And I felt that the role of history is very important. So I wanted to look at women and, and their history and how they make sense of growing up during apartheid, for example. And the TLC was a space that offered people the... The, the platform to be able to talk about the experiences of the, gr the gross human violation that they had. But one of the things that came up was that it was very difficult for many women to speak about some of the things that happened to them because some of them were raped, some of them experienced very gruesome violation of their bodies while they were in prison. And the TRC really didn't offer that space for them to be able to speak about some of the things that could be perceived as shameful to speak about. And I wanted to highlight what happens when there are hidden stories, when there are unspoken stories. Mm -hmm. So by interrogating these narratives, I, was, I wanted to highlight the need to look for other ways in which they can express the symbolic pain that many of them still walk around with. And, and I mean, with your background in psychology, um, do you find yourself incorporating um, a psychological um, background and, and, and narratives within your transcripts? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Because the idea was to look at how suffering 
is 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 you know um, is is um, is experienced and also trauma as well. That trauma is not an individual experience, but a collective experience, especially as a country with our with our history. Looking at how people were oppressed, looking at how people suffered, that suffering did not happen at an individual level. So it was important for me to highlight how the social part of it, the collective part of it that we as a people experienced is also important when we speak about notions of trauma. And you spoke earlier on about the girl child and I can mm -hmm. I, I could sense um, from your response that you had passion for the girl child for women to receive as much information and encourage to study further and and, and of course uh, improve on their knowledge but mm -hmm. let's talk about the national youth mentoring campaign with that said how are you involved with them um, it's a role mod it's a role model campaign which was initiated by the National Research Foundation where they felt that there are areas of, of our country spaces where the youth, especially the girls, are not uh, coming into contact with role models, female role models that they can speak to, not only about their personal lives, but also about career opportunities in various fields. And they decided that um, they're going to look at a number of women that they can use as role models. And I was fortunate enough to be one of them where we, we visit schools in some of our rural communities where we engage with the young women to speak about the possibilities that are out there for us. And it has been a rewarding experience because it's not only about the career choices, mm -hmm. but it's about mentoring as well, where we don't only go there and speak to them yeah they can still contact us and we can remain in contact in speaking about the possibilities for their future. Wow. Dr. Puleng mm. Sakalo, thank you so much for your time and joining us this weekend. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, that was Dr. Puleng Sakalo, senior lecturer from the Department of Psychology at UNISA. I can just say that as a young woman myself, I'm definitely inspired by her. Well, we'll talk a short break right now and when we return, Maruma Kekan updates you on all the NTN8 action. Stay tuned. Africa is symbolized by these magnificent trees. The Sunland Big Baobab is carbon dated to be around 1,600 years old. When baobabs become 1,000 years old, they begin to hollow inside. In the Big Baobab, this has resulted in the world famous Baobab tree bar. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News.